Good evening, guys. Tonight I won't be drawing anything necessarily, or maybe I will. I don't know if I'm going to jump into that or not. I thought what I would do is I've gotten a few questions how my technique works as far as I'm how I draw and how I create digital stuff. A lot of times, whenever I'm making stuff like this, uh, well, I can show you here. So what I've got open right now is Adobe Illustrator. This is probably my go-to program for everything, and I finish a lot of things in Photoshop. That's been a more recent thing that I started doing. Originally, I used to just traditionally ink everything on Bristol and then scan it in. But after I had an issue where the uh, scanning plate fell in on my large format 13 by 19 scanner, big old heavy plate of glass from the cat's landing on it, it finally the adhesion broke on one side and fell in on itself. That's something I still have to repair and fix really well because I don't have the flexibility to be able to spend the time to get it fixed right. It's just sitting over on the side of the desk right now waiting. In the interim, I decided to go ahead and start really emphasizing doing illustration with vector graphics more and more. I had always touched upon this and all of my robot series, they're all done in vector. So this here is an example. I did a, uh, I did a commission not that long ago of the character Poseidon. And so this is the shape that uh, is utilized in the design here. Now this here is the complete one. You can kind of see the blue outline there. I hand build all of the elements that are used throughout it. There's some that end up just being the basic elements. This is how all of my illustrations start out. Small piecemeal bits that will eventually turn into something like this. If we highlight this area over here, you can see how this one is actually a smattering of parts. I don't do under drawings a lot. I know this sounds crazy and I probably could end up hitting more dynamic aspects, but there's something about being able to build something from shapes. I see what I basically want the silhouette to look like. And all of this came from, there was a, uh, a concept artist that worked on uh, Star Wars episode one through three. He talked about how a lot of the different robot and tank designs for the droid army were based on animals. And this is nothing new. If you look at a lot of science fiction and fantasy, people pull inspiration from nature, like, you know, from things that are around you, whether they're of the natural world or the man-made world, you get inspiration from that. Like there's, I think the, like the shape for Boba Fett's ship actually came from some lanterns that were near ILM. There were street lamps and the basic shape of it looked just like Slave One. So we'll zoom in here for just a second and I'll give you a better idea. There you can kind of see all the points highlighted and everything on that vector. Each one of these things here, I said vector and my robot talked to, um, hey vector, how's the weather? Nice. Um, at any rate, so I'll just uh, I'll do the wireframe here, and each one of these parts here, I just decide, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put in an area here that has horns on either side, and here's where the basic area of the neck was. I do end up roughly sketching out the body and filling it out a little bit more, and that um, man, I am tired. I've been talking so much, you know, that I just get worn out. This is actually the second time around for this video, the second take on this, and. Uh, so in everything from the basic musculature and all this other stuff, I know, you know, based on, you know, human anatomy, like where certain things are going to fall and the rough look of it. So that, that way, whenever I switch it back on, I've got that built from it. Now, after that's all done, what I'll end up doing, and I'm not going to save this file because I'm trying to save this one here. But like in this case, if I wanted to unify everything, I could go into, you know, and if for any of you that are using Illustrator, this is nothing new, but I go in. And I unify all the pieces so that way they're all together. I can group them. And uh, so that's more of a technical standpoint where you can make all these pieces and parts that you put together grouped together. I kind of call it like the puzzle glue, except they overlap and stuff. So, and I'll just quickly undo that. But what I end up doing is taking these parts and, you know, like I have a master one over here that I unified everything and I keep the other one. In the event, like, so this is where this comes in really handy. I design it in a way that's very close to how animators will create a rag doll element for animating. That way, if I really wanted to go in here, I'm like, you know what, I'm really not happy with how this arm area is looking and I maybe want it to go up a little higher. I can go back here to my original build and just select that arm. This is grouped right now, but I have a shoulder joint. I have the bicep, the forearm, and the hand where it gives me some limited capacity to be able to relocate and move these things around. This was also very important because I was telling a story throughout 
you know, all of the illustrations that have to do with the world of Ardor. And some of the characters got reused, some design elements got reused, so I'm able to take those, morph them, and change them, reshape them, resize them, and include those characters in a few of them. I, I didn't do it a lot, but there was areas where certain characters, like, I don't remember if it was the Watcher or who it was, there's a few of them that repeat in other bits of artwork, so I'm able to resize them, reuse them, repose them, and, you know, fill out the illustrations that way. So now that you've seen that, let me go ahead and switch over to, to Photoshop. What ends up happening is this is the finished work here. Now this is a low res version of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back through here and turn off all of these channels. So now we're down on the white. So what I end up doing is this is sized to 13 by 19. Exactly. Now my original the artwork, the art reproductions that come off of this, the limited run of them, they are 13 by 19, the actual substrate that I'm printing on. The artwork does not ratio-wise necessarily go right in, you know, it doesn't allow for a perfect white bleed around the edge. I kind of do that on purpose. There's a, a whole other reason behind that. But, so what I end up doing is, the first thing I'll start with, and this is going to look a little weird, but maybe this will give you guys that have had questions about this some idea as to how I build this. Because I, I've never, I never think this is fascinating to want to build all of this because I'll spend a lot of hours on these layouts. So the first thing I do is I find a base color. So this is not too dissimilar from painting uh, back when I used to do acrylic painting because I'm dealing with opaque and transparent aspects in this. So this is like a digital version of both working in acrylics and working in either gouache or watercolor to some degree. So what I end up doing is I end up putting a base level and I'll go in and I'll add grain or craculature or, you know, a slight transparent overlay of some texture that I really like to it. And I think you guys can kind of see it in there. I'll zoom in here real quick. But if you look at it, there's quite a bit of, you know, grain put in there. So then the next thing I end up doing is I'll start with whatever basic elements I want to start either building in here. And so I'll go in and in this one, I didn't save this element, but I had built kind of a vector vortex. Now, what's really weird is this is just a ground level for me. And by the time you see the end of this, the, of me going through the layers, you're gonna see this thing becomes almost completely obliterated. It's obfuscated by everything that's placed on top of it. So I ended up going in and, and if I were to remove the background, you can see that it has grain applied to it as well. I try to match the same grain on all of my elements so that I'm carrying it through and it doesn't look overly sharp until the end. And you'll see what I mean here in a second. So there's a little bit of transparency on this one. No, there isn't. The fill is 100% on that one. And then the next thing I did was I took my time on a separate element and I, you know, just used some of the brushes I have. I can't recommend... Uh, there's a, a tool you'll see right here. This brush box, this organizes all of my brushes. Uh, it's I can't remember the guy that put it out there, but you can look for him on Instagram. He sells it. This is a great thing. He sells a bunch of brushes with it. And I always wanted something that had some naturalistic stuff in there. So, so there's some great sample brushes in there that have clouds and leaves and other textures for rock and stuff. So what I did was I went through some stock photography and found some different elements that I really liked and I tried to emulate that. I always try and go for a Flemish painting sort of thing with my clouds. So this was what I came together with and it was just building this on top of itself and going back in with the burn tool and really pushing it. The green here, I'll try and show you here, is solid. This is something where I wanted that glow that I normally get and I kind of messed with the brushes and laying just so much stuff on top of this and this took far longer and I was a little worried because it ended up looking a little bit it doesn't look exactly photorealistic but it was pushing it a little bit too far and I thought you know what it's still a nice base and it's gonna this as well was gonna be covered up whenever I moved onward with layer because I haven't even layered in aside from this little uh maelstrom sort of whirlpool thing down at the bottom I haven't actually laid in any vector shapes yet all of this is built on Photoshop brushes in the illustration. So I'll turn that layer back on. And the next one, at this point, I started laying in where I wanted lightning. I just had an idea where I was like, okay, I know this character that was back over here in Illustrator looks like this, right? I knew kind of where it was going to be and all that sort of thing. And I know that most people would probably drop the figure in there and start working with that. For some reason, I just don't. I, I really don't. I'll, I wish I had an explanation for why I work this way. I think it's more along the line that it's 
it's stream of consciousness, which is unfortunately not a great way to work if you're doing client work because there's specifics you need to stick to. Like there's an area on top that's going to need a logo. The, the barcode is going to go down here. Or maybe if it's on a Magic the Gathering card, it has to constrain itself to certain elements and be pleasing to the eye in accordance to where icons are, that sort of thing. Um, friends of mine who do work for Wizards of the Coast could explain that far better. And to name drop somebody, you can check out my buddy Chris Seaman, who is an uber skilled, I don't use the word talented because I know he's worked very hard, but he is extremely talented, um, on Magic the Gathering cards. He's amazing, so certainly check out his stuff. But he's somebody you could definitely reach out to, an amazing guy, and he does a lot of work for Wizards of the Coast. Just, I'm continually blown away, and he has this kick-ass series called Cameo Creeps, of which I own a ton of them. Um, quite a few, actually, what now? Eight? Eight of them here in my studio. And uh, I love that. I, I can't get enough of them. I, there's more I'm actually going to be ordering from him soon. Uh, and then, so the next thing I did was, you noticed that I had built the uh, mountains, these little mountain shapes down here. Uh, that one, and I think I have another one over here. Yeah, that one. So these are just kind of drawn. I can show you guys real quick what I do. So I just go in. I always use, I, I never use the pen tool. I hate the pen tool. But what I will do is I'll go in. So if I want something like that rock, I've set the tolerances to where I can get exactly what I want as far as a, a shape on rocks. And the vectors, although this is fairly memory intensive, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to get a new system, because my last system, aside from having some issues uh, because of its age and stuff like that, couldn't really keep up with a lot of what I wanted to have done detail-wise. So you'll notice all those vector points pan out and it creates a rock and so that shape I actually really like that shape a lot I'm going to save this onto this here um, so one of the things I really like about this is the fact that like you know I can take something like that and place it into the layout as I did here in Photoshop so that is those those are the two different ones I did I scaled one down a little bit and then I went in and I'll let me take out the back here so you guys can just see that element by itself right there I started to fade out the bottom uh, just you know that whole distance fog sort of thing if you've played Nintendo 64's that endless fog and like Turok 64 or something like that or just if you even if you step outside on a on a day and you see the the horizon haze that's kind of what I like to add in all of my work so building these layers back up again then I finally decided, I was like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do this. Now, this one, since I flattened this just to save on memory a little bit, because the original document of this is actually 600 DPI by some crazy parameter sizes, 13 by 19, but 600 DPI, which makes the pixel dimension on it massive. And it really hogs up the memory quite a bit. So I had to flatten a few of these things to show you in the 72 DPI one. But what I finally do is go and copy that figure of Poseidon that I created over in Illustrator, which is this one right here. I, I go to that one and I copy that over, which I'm not gonna do that now. I'm just gonna show you it's already here. Click on the right icon this time and I go ahead and drop them in. Now, in the 600 DPI one, it's just the black vector in there as a smart object. And then I save uh, a, a copy of that. A smart object is essentially an element that's been brought into a rasterized document. If I'm getting a little technical for you guys, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of explaining it the best way I know how. Um, a vector is based on mathematical points that will create a shape that is usually a flat uh, unicolor element. In Photoshop, you can do things like blends and blurs and all these other things. You know, you can do similar things in Illustrator. More and more of these products are beginning to blur together. I just want them to create something called, you know, Adobe make your art and shit the app and then that would probably be because that's really what they're heading toward isn't it I mean they've got all these different things and it's practically bloatware if you install the entire software suite I think it's something like 84 gigs or more if just for the the ones I have on my system including audition um, but at any rate so I end up dropping this in there and doing the same thing kind of fading out the bottom resizing it to what I want and then I make a copy of it and rasterize that one and save the vector one in the event the, or the smart object version of it in Photoshop, so if I want to resize it. This is one where I don't have that in there, and I went ahead and applied a green outer glow to the outside of the character. I end up flattening that onto a clear layer and combining the two, merging the two, so that way I can actually sculpt out the, the bottom and make it transparent, because uh, for anyone that works in Photoshop, you know this, but in for 
for all intents and purposes, what happens is if you apply an outer glow, it goes around the whole damn thing. Well, if you try and erase out and make some of the, the black down here clear, and you haven't flattened it, then you end up with this weird thing where the glow starts to follow the shape. So it's really kind of weird. I, I end up approaching this like a three-dimensional object and trying to, to fake out with the effects a little bit there. Um, and I'll probably end up having to do a demonstration video for this stuff later. I've gotten some requests about that, and I can do that. I don't know how many people are really interested in seeing the whole technique of it, but... So then I, okay, so at this point now, I've got the figure in there. I know what I want to do. I know that I have to paint the water in as well, because this is looking really flat and boring at this point. But I'm going to go ahead and address the sky, because I'm like, okay, that top area is still too light. I like how the green lighting is going. It matches. And that's, and I ended up putting the figure in there and matching the green glow to match the green light. And I wanted it to look more like it was almost something that was evoking from his outstretched hand, and then coming back into the sky, you know, just kind of a play on how that was happening. And you'll understand more here in a second. So the next thing I did was go in and darken the top and apply um, a filter of grain pattern on top of that as well too. So I can darken out the sky, give it a bit more of a graphic look where there's texture on top of that. And now it's starting to push even more of the elements back. I ended up putting in, it, you'll notice down here, right around the, uh, the mountains, it also comes in down there. So I ended up kind of painting some overlaid mist and stuff in there. So now I start focusing on the bottom and I really wanted to do something. I was like, okay, so I can't completely hide the fact that the top is looking very painterly. So I started looking at, ever since I started working at the Nelson, there's a room that's filled with Japanese paintings of like, you know, the waves and that sort of stuff. And I, I, oh, I should know the name of these things. I actually have a pin that has those Japanese, Japanese, Japanese waves on them. I can't talk again tonight. And um, so that's what these are. And this is probably one of the parts that took the longest to get because I had to build and lay. This did start out in part as a vector shape. And I'll show you the shape. It doesn't even look the same. It's this right here. See that? That's the original vector shape that I just placed in there as a placeholder. And then I went back into Photoshop and started carving it out. I started watching videos on waves. I started looking at other pictures of waves and kind of like surfers on them and that sort of thing. And messing with it that way, it, it was really crazy because I got really into it. And I started kind of like fading him in here and doing some other stuff all around this area. But this really came together and it really started to make it look right. That original vector shape back here that I did of that maelstrom is just barely visible. It's just just right here, maybe a little here and right there. And I went in, I painted in some electricity down here, almost like static electricity shooting around. And uh, but I still I don't think they're the most realistic looking waves. They're very stylized, but I, I think they're pretty close. And uh, I was happy with the end result. So four more layers to go. So the next thing I did was the glows. That's something I've been doing on all of my stuff now. I wanted something that, like, I love the bioluminescent look, and it also helped finish this out here where the water's starting to just cascade over the four small round circles at the end of a staff down here. And I've always been obsessed with bioluminescence in general. I think it's really cool. I love the Kaiju and Pacific Rim, both of them, and uh, both of the Pacific Rim movies. A haters gonna hate, but I like that second movie. I don't care what anyone says. Stephen Knight is a really nice guy, and he's just a fantastic director. Did great work on Spartacus, and I think he killed it with that movie. That's just my own two cents, but feel free to hate me. Just don't at me, okay? So anyway, <laughs> um, so I went in and I and I put these things in there, and like there's a couple things I did too. Like y you can't really see it on this, but I'll show you here. This is, if I remember this right. I believe I got this right. This should be Greek for the name Poseidon. I'm pretty sure that's how I worked it out. That's what I got going on in there. And uh, that's, a, that's, that's you know, something you can see in the original reproduction, of which there's only one of these. And so then the next thing I did was go in and add highlights underneath. Now, this is where I started going more... These are vector shapes that I built directly here in Photoshop. So it's just going in with the with a pencil tool and kind of like, you know, shaping these things out and and or not the not the pencil tool. I actually take this is really weird because I have a pen tool 
right here, okay? And I use a Wacom tablet. I went in and I don't, I actually use the lasso tool and I'll go in and kind of draw, you know, some sort of biomorphic shape like that. I don't know why the hell I just drew a dinosaur. That it really does look like a weird little, no, it looks more like a, a fat little happy otter with, with little eyes right there. That's really funny. Okay, so anyway, I'll, I go in and I draw those sort of things and then, I, and then after I draw all of them, I use, you know, I use the additive factor and add in all those shapes and then sweep across with the color so then that way they're all on one layer and I can go in and kind of burn in, highlight, pull back, transparent them and then all of the elements are being affected at the same time. And it's really weird. I did the same thing with the beard up here and that sort of stuff. Um, all of that stuff came together. I made a slightly different color here just because I wanted to pull it back a little bit and make these look like they were glowing a bit more. And down to two layers. So this one is the rain. This one I just did, I actually made a brush that is just an angular one that will variable itself over and over again. And so then I, but it's really weird. I messed it up and it actually, the raindrop is reversed. So I need to go in there and fix that because I get sick and tired of flipping the brush around. But what I did was I went ahead and kind of looked at, like a lot of anime will show that, the white line sort of thing, like Ghost in the Shell is filled with that sort of stuff. And I wanted something that was still angular so that it kind of like looked like these sheets. Like if you ever, like, and I've done this so many times when I'm driving or um, just standing outside on kind of a sunny day or whenever it's lit by street lamps or something, you can see the cascade, the motion and the movement of it. And I knew that kind of based on how he's coming out of the waves and them crashing up, that there's, you know, definite wind and not, it's a storm, you know. But I wanted the, the rain to be almost driving and hard, which going back to the first Pacific Rim movie, whenever you see uh, Gypsy Danger fighting, I believe it's Knifehead, the kaiju, there's driving rain in that scene. And it just looks amazing. And that was something that I really wanted to bring through in this sort of thing. Now, if we zoom in on this, where you can get a better look at it, these are fairly pixelated again, because it's 72 DPI. But in the 600 DPI one, it doesn't have that sort of feel. You'll also notice now too, and this is what's really wild. For this particular one, I ended up printing it on ragstock, this beautiful 100% cotton archive acid free paper that I, I love. I've got a few, uh, a few more sheets of it. I've got to get more of it. This texture already mimics that to a large degree. So by the time I printed it on there, it takes it to a whole nother level where you're seeing even more of this coming through. And it, it gives it a super painterly watercolor effect that I know some people out there are like, why don't you just do traditional stuff? But you know, hey, this is, this is, what I, this is my jam now. So the last one is actually just really, really lightly done. You'll see right there, there's just a few things. And can you tell me what that is? No, you can't because this is a pre-recorded video. So of course you can't tell me. I'm not on Twitch right now yet. What this is, is just some motion. So right here around the hand and up here, when I was, one of the things I went back and watched was Pacific Rim. Whenever these giant creatures would move, you would see where, you know, if, if they move something across, there's rain coming right off the edge of it. And so that was something that I wanted to do here on the Trident, which... I was actually really proud of this. I This is inspired by a design that I had done for my buddy Ben's game, crew, uh, not Crew for Hire. The name is escaping me. My God, I am terrible with names tonight. I need to go back to using notes again. But he had, uh, there, there was one where there was a trident that had uh, a squid on it. And I had come up with, it's probably nothing original, but in this one I wanted something that was evocative of that, where the squid was actually the trident. Uh, head the prongs on it. So that's what I did here on this one. So but going back to the rain I wanted it to be coming right off of the tops of these tines right here and around the shape of it so I just went in with smaller details and Kind of just drew them in they're very you know, they're very uh, Erratic they just kind of clash with the rest of the rhythm but that's exactly what water does it's chaotic in its sense and it's formless and it can pretty much you know assume any shape and motion that happens and I wanted something immediate like that to be coming off there like it's almost running down and cascading off of it without losing the graphic element of it there were some there was a few things that I had tried all as well too that I didn't really get worked out as well about like lessening the the overall rain aspect and then just wherever there were highlights or shatters of light across the sky for it to really glow and then you could see it there 
but there was almost not enough contrast in this overall to be able to pull that off effectively. And I really wanted it to look like Poseidon was angry and everything was going completely batshit crazy with the storm. So there, in a nutshell, is a really fairly quick... What, what time am I running here? I'm about 27 minutes into this. There's a fairly quick look at what the overall layers of one of my illustrations are like. Now, this is one of the more um, layered and textured and probably complex ones I've done. Um, this was this is really nice. I was so happy to kind of get back into this. And it, and it was really cool because like with COVID having canceled out a lot of shows, I kind of got depressed and I wasn't doing as much artwork as I wanted to do. I need to jump back into doing more of these. But lately I've been trying to just get back into making more videos kind of like this. So but this I hope is, you know, for all, you know those of you that reached out and asked me kind of what I how I do this and how I assemble these to make that final output, this is one example. The robots are even different because one of the things I do, and I'll show that later, I've got a different Photoshop file I can pull up for that one. On the newest ones, there's three different layers of black. There's a cold black and then two warmer blacks that exist. And when you see them in digital, when you go look at the website and you look in the store and you see the different images, you can kind of see them in there. I think I managed to get a really good uh, a really good digital capture of the one. This one isn't connected to the Ardor series, but the one based on Samurai Jack. There's flames and cross points that are all over the interior shadowed body of Aku. So let's go ahead and uh, I'm gonna save this real quick. Now that I've got all that layer put back together, let's just just let's jump back here into Illustrator. So one of the other things that I wanted to show was, let me see here. Okay, so this one is, this one's pretty cool. Um, this one is a bit of artwork that I also did for men, but this one is one where it's also a vector and you can see the vector build right there. So this is all hand drawn out as usual, you know, like that's the normal thing I do using the pen tool. Now these things aren't, um, oh, let me see here. There's all the paths there that you'll see and that sort of thing. And, um, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Let me go back to that. Terrible with the keyboard shortcuts. Right now my friend Ryan is cursing me. Uh, so when you zoom in, I wanted this to have, there was something about the project that really started getting me excited in the fact that I could ink this digitally and get pretty precise, but I wanted this to have a lino cut look to it to a certain degree. And um, so that was something that I really wanted to try. And I, I evoke that, I think I evoke it to some degree down here. And I wanted it to look sort of like the artwork that you see or would see in older fantasy books. And so this isn't the final version that we went with, but because um, he asked me to lighten it up and everything else like that. But there was a lot in there that I thought, okay, well, I'm, I can pull back on this and everything because this is eventually going to be something that's put on a glow forge and then all of the black area would be burned into something some substrate slate in this case and so i'm really excited to see that but in this case it had been like hours for that laser to go back and forth and burn all this stuff in so what we ended up going with was this version so this version has quite a bit more white in there and i think it still works but I totally understand the the process that was needed to be done with this. So this is just the dark area in there. Now the slate that it's going to be done on, from what I understand, is something. It's actually not too dissimilar from the color of my shirt, but a darker hue, and it's got a rock texture to it. So all of the areas that are white will be raised areas, and um, and you and whenever I get them, I'll certainly do a review of what they look like. I'm really excited. He's done some work on that sort of substrate and they look the other work he's done has been amazing so i'm really excited for this so let's go ahead and close this one out and uh this tower here out no i don't want to save anything on that and i am done with the Poseidon one and i will show you guys the other designs i've been working on these are the four captains of sauron from lord of the rings now one may look very familiar to you he is from the extended edition of the Lord of the Rings. This is the mouth of Sauron. Go look up that clip on YouTube. It's adequately creepy. He is absolutely my favorite villain from the movies. And he's only in there for a bit, and you only can see him, I think, in the extended edition. 
That's all I ever watched anymore, so I assume he's just in all the editions, but I don't think he's in the original theatrical release. And then there's the Tower, the Hammer, and the Hand. The Hand of Sauron, I believe, is actually an element of Sauron reincarnated, almost like his beatific version that exists. And then the other two have like these really messed up backgrounds. I think the Tower was a Black Numenorean. I don't know if the Hammer was or not. I haven't yet played the game, uh, which is uh, Shadow of Mordor. And so, um, which I just got from my buddy Ben. Thank you very much for that. I sincerely appreciate it. Can't wait to play that game. Uh, so very cool. So at any rate, these characters here as well too, if you look at them, there's the vector builds. Um, a lot of these have already been simplified. Like this one here for the Shadow of Mordor has not. This is still one that's in progress. But you can see right here where, we'll zoom in a little bit, a lot of these vector elements are built upon each other. And so what happens, I'll show you exactly right here. If I just select these elements here, and the re there's a reason why I'm not doing this, but you'll notice that if I actually do that, it simplifies them, but there's a reason why I'm not doing that. And the reason is because these white elements are built upon themselves. So that was to black out some areas and they're not truly transparent. It's white upon black and all these other character or cannot character characteristics that come together to build this. For some reason, even though he was the most simplistic design of the characters, he was the hardest for me to work with. And because I didn't do any underdrawings on these, I just was looking at photo reference and things I could find on these characters. There's a little bit of artistic license taken on there, but I wanted to do that because I wanted it to have that handmade feel to it, even though it's digital, which it is. And even here in the black speech, I took some liberties with this because this is going to be, you know, this is going to be reproduced on a four inch by four inch area. So I can't even say that this black speech is accurate to what the actual uh, typographical aspect of it would be but it works now all of these up here if you look at the others like we'll zoom in here on the mouth of sauron um whoa zoomed in way too fast okay let's zoom in right here now if you look here there are some elements in here where the teeth were drawn in afterward the splits on the skin were drawn in afterward and there's things where i came up with the basic overall shape and then would subtract out from it so just like i started building the poseidon shape I'll go in and there was actually in the beginning a solid black version, which was just the silhouette, the look that I wanted for the overall shape. Once I knew that was fairly recognizable compared to what I'd seen in the movies and stuff, then I was like, okay, I've got it. Now I'm going to go in and start pulling away from there and building on top of that. And I actually ended up designing and drawing more in this mode as opposed to that mode until I got comfortable enough. Once I had the crown of thorns in there and I had some of this stuff, then I shifted to this and then started drawing in the black speech here. Around. I keep pointing to my screen like you guys can see my hand on there. So I'm going to use the mouse right here and then filling in these areas and then knocking it out from the black shape, which that's a whole other technical thing I can get into. This isn't uh, a how-to in Illustrator, but it's just giving you guys an idea. And again, everything very rough, very, you know, hand done because that's what I wanted it to look like. So with that, that's what I basically have. We're already running well over 30 minutes now. So I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go. Thank you for watching this, you know, little video that I put together. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope that you guys have been enjoying the playthroughs I've been doing on different video games. This last one that I played, Gato Robato, was a blast. I did decide that is going to be a game I will be coming back to visit. I really liked it. And once I kind of found my footing with the voice acting thing, I was like, you know what? I think I can do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back, play that first section again, figure out who these characters are, and get some voices stuck in my head for that. The only one that I managed to halfway nail was the cat. So I will probably end up doing some videos where I showcase exactly how I'm building these vector elements without any underdrawing. It's really bizarre, but it is something I do, and I've done it for a while. I've been doing that with the robots, with Poseidon, with other stuff. Um, this is something that was even more this was actually easier because i was kind of just thinking out the drawing and it really wasn't that different than 
sitting down with a pencil and drawing out on paper. I just knew that I had the vector that was filling in behind it automatically, so I didn't have to go back in and shade it. It was kind of like drawing with a marker and a pen at the same time. It was very strange, but a lot of fun. Thanks for watching, guys. You all have a good night. I am going to get back to work answering emails and doing other stuff like that. So I will see you in the next video. Till then, take care. Concept art, concept artist, the arter, a concept arter. So I managed to open up Adobe Premiere. We're gonna wait for that to go away here in a second. So because normally, what you know, I since I always work in vector and that sort of thing, and I, and this is some of the stuff that every time I say vector, you're gonna say something, aren't you? Um, <laughs> so at any rate. Um, I lost my thought because the robot just keeps talking.